talk about finite integral domains and whether they're fields, if you remember, which you may not remember, but Mike remembers because he asked me whether this is true or not. And um, I kind of teased him and said that he should prove it. Well, I waited and waited and he hasn't proved it. So I thought, ah, if you want to get something done right, you got to do it yourself. So I'm going to prove this for you. And I, I guess I have to, I owe Mike some uh, Maggie now because I've, I've given him a hard time. Um, I'm not going to write out scratch work for this proof. Um, this proof is pretty simple. So let's suppose that we have a finite integral domain. If we have a finite integral domain, we can list out the elements, d1, d2, all the way to dn. The key is here that I know that there's a last element. So I'm going to assume in this case that there's n elements in this finite domain. We, what we need to show is, to get this thing to be a field, we need to show that given any arbitrary d, with d not equal to 0, that d is going to be invertible. So what I'm going to do is a little trick. I'm going to consider the products, um, d times the first element, d times the second element, and so forth. So I have n products. I claim that there's going to be, dis the, all these products are distinct. That means that none of them are equal. Well, if they were equal, I'm going to assume that two were equal. Let's see what happens. Let's suppose that I have a d times di, one of those inside the products, that's equal to d times dj. Well, there's a theorem in our book that says that when we're on an integral domain, we're allowed to cancel as long as um, the d is not zero. So we can slash out the d from both sides, and that tells us that di is equal to dj. So what this is telling us is that the only way that two of the products in that list could be equal is if they were the same element to begin with. That means that I have n distinct products. And since there's n distinct elements in the integral domain, all of these products must be one element, one distinct element in the integral domain. Now, I just want to caution that theorem 19.5 says that, doesn't say this just for integral domains, it actually is a little bit more general. It says that we can cancel non-zero elements as long as there are no zero divisors in our, um, in our ring. Well, integral domains do not have zero divisors, which is why I'm allowed to apply this in this case. Since these products are all distinct, there's as many different products as elements in D. So one of the elements in D is the element, the multiplicative identity, 1. So we know that d times di must be equal to 1 for some i, somewhere along the way. But integral domains are commutative, so I know that di times d is the same as d times di. So di times d is equal to 1 as well. Therefore, we have that di is the inverse of d by definition, and all non-zero elements are going to have multiplicative inverses. Um, and since d was arbitrarily chosen, um, that's why I'm allowed to say that all non-zero elements have a multiplicative inverse. This proves that D is a field because the only thing missing from integral domains to step up to a field is that the, we have multiplicative inverses. So this just proved that we have multiplicative inverses and we're done.